How to YouTube? Well, it's still winter here in Western Pennsylvania, but I have put off this project for far too long. I'm gonna get started on what's probably gonna be a couple of two or three part series building this. Uh, this is a snake cage. For those of you who are new to the channel, my wife is a veterinarian, and so we've picked up an assortment of critters over the years, one of which is this red-tailed boa constrictor, and she's clearly way too big for the 20 long tank that she's in. So we're gonna build some frames, we're gonna stick some glass in them, and when we're all done, hopefully we have something that looks a little bit better and is definitely a little bit larger. All right, what I'm doing now is I'm looking at the stock that I have and I'm selecting which boards are ultimately gonna become which pieces in the final project. Uh, if you are really strapped for material, you may not have this luxury, but I got a big old pile of walnut over here. It's probably enough to make two or three of these cages out of. So I'm gonna go ahead and make good choices on matching grain and grain direction, stuff like that where I can. But I don't have complete and total freedom here. For instance, this bottom frame of the cage that holds up the glass and is one of the main structural pieces is one inch thick material. Well, this is the only board that I have that I think is still gonna be an inch thick once I'm done milling it. So I gotta figure out how to get all of the pieces for that frame out of this board. Miter saw is used to cut the 10 footers down to something a little bit more manageable. Although some of the final pieces are over six feet long. So manageable is in the eye of the beholder. From there we go to the bandsaw to rip them down to an oversized rough width. Now you'll notice how much this board is rocking and rolling around on the table. This is why you use a bandsaw or something without a rotating blade to make these kind of cuts. It's a recipe for binding and kickback on something like the table saw. The jointer makes short work of those rough faces and gives you one flat side that you can then prop up against the back to get a square corner. Well, as I feared, I had to take a little more off of this material than I really wanted to at the jointer to get it flat and square. So I'm not gonna end up with my full inch thickness. Uh, it's gonna be somewhere between 800 and 900 thou. But for this piece of the thing, doesn't matter at all. With such narrow pieces, the planer's got more than enough oomph to take a pretty big bite out of this walnut but I chose to keep some kind of interesting grain, so I kept the passes pretty shallow, a sixteenth of an inch or less. Of course, they're shallow and then they're shallow. This long piece was so tapered that I only ended up planing about half of it. The rest just slid through. Several passes before I was getting a full length cut. Once the planing's done, it's back to the table saw to rip to the final width of three inches. The long rails of this frame are way too long for any sort of a stop lock. So I marked them with a knife, clamped them to the sled, and lined them up with the blade by eye as best as I could. With one end cut flush and square, I can use the stop block to ensure that all of these cross pieces come out the exact same length. This one, I wasn't sure how deep that grain feature ran. I half expected it to explode when the blade hit it. I kept the long rails clamped together while I measured and marked the center locations for where the cross pieces go. Little arrows helped me to remember which rail was on which side when I was measuring. We're also gonna need the center location on the cross pieces. The drill press makes sure the pilot holes are nice and straight, even though the walnut really wants to stick to the bit. I am putting as close to zero clamping force as it's possible to put on a pipe clamp. Unfortunately, I don't have anything a little less beefy that's that long. I use the holes in the long rails as a guide to drill pilot holes in the cross rails. This keeps them from splitting out when the screws are driven. Speaking of which, did you ever wonder what it looks like through the camera when you're filming a YouTube video? Guess who recorded the wrong thing? All right, one down, at least two to go. I wanna mark out the wood for the front and the sides of the enclosure so that they can all go through the planer at the same time. Um, in theory, with that digital depth gauge on there, you could come back two or three times and get wood that was all the same thickness, but uh, doing it all simultaneously is still the best bet. Okay, and here's our boards for the side and front frames milled S5S. Their final width, thickness, and have one end cut off square. This particular walnut is air dried, so it's pretty stable, but uh, I went ahead and milled about 80% of the wood off of these boards and let them sit for two or three days just to see if they were gonna move before I came back and I did the final jointing and planing operations. And the reason they're not cut to final length is because I've been kind of hemming and hawing about the joinery. The rail and style construction of these frames sort of screams out mortise and tenon, 
But the reality is for this project, uh, there's just really no need to go to that level of complication. So I'm going to go simple and just do half lap joints to put these things together. Half lap gives me a couple of advantages, in fact, over the mortise and tenon. Number one is that uh, the tooling is ridiculously simple. I can cut the whole thing on the table saw. Another cool thing about a half lap is that there are a couple of critical dimensions here, and the half lap is going to let us sneak up on each of them individually in isolation. I'll show you what I mean as we go through putting these frames together. Here's the stop block arrangement I came up with for cutting all of these parts to final length. It's janky at best, but I really, really wanted to have a stop block, and this is the only way I could get it. Measuring, marking, and cutting by eye just didn't seem like it was going to cut it for all of these frame pieces, especially when they're all the same length. Here's the first critical dimension for the half lap joint. It's the height of the dado blade, which determines how much of the wood thickness we're going to cut away. In theory, it should be exactly half. The only way to get it exactly half that I know of is to make test cuts. Now, because the dado blade leaves a rough surface, you need to sand it up a little bit. But once you get it right, you should not be able to feel where those two boards come together across the joint. And so it's finally time to make an irreversible cut in the real parts. I'm making a couple of X's with a silver sharpie. Cut here, dummy, so I don't cut a half lap on the wrong side of the board. I'm using a Paul Sellers inspired technique here, using the board to set the square and then the square to make a knife line. The knife line is what I'm actually going to cut to. It's pretty easy to line up with the teeth on the saw blade and it's really, really accurate. Once I'm sure that I'm cutting right on my knife line, I'm going to set the stop block on the miter gauge so that I can cut all the pieces to exactly this same half lap width. One of the nice features of this miter gauge is that you can flip that stop block up without moving it. So after you've made your uh, really critical cut, you can get it out of the way, slide the board down, and nibble away the rest of that half lap. Okay, I've cut one half lap in my bottom rail for the side of the cage, but I haven't cut the other one. Only have an X marks the spot. Uh, that's because this rail is intentionally a little bit oversized. To find out where the back edge of this half lap needs to be, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the bottom frame that it needs to fit. This is a piece that's the same thickness as my front material, and I'm just going to use it as a spacer flush this up here so that I know I have my rail in exactly the place where it finally needs to go. Then I can come back here to the back of the frame and sure enough I've got about a sixteenth of an inch overhang. I'm going to bring in my style which is already cut and I'm going to line it up not with the end of the rail but flush with the back of the support frame. That gives me a guide to make a knife mark that will show me exactly where my half lap should end. Once it's lined up with the blade, I'm going to set the stop on the Craig miter gauge so that I can cut the top rail to exactly the same length. All right, with all the half laps cut, I did a dry fit and everything checks out. Measures the same corner to corner so it's square and all the joints come together nice and tight. Um, so why am I using epoxy to <laughs> glue this up? Well, there's two reasons. One, I have a gallon of the stuff that I bought for this workbench. I got to use it on something. Um, and two, my dado blade does not leave the best, like most pristine surface. Um, router really would have done a better job there. But uh, anyway, there's a couple little bumps and grooves in there and I figure since I got to use the epoxy on something, it might as well fill those in. Part of the reason I like working with epoxy is the viscosity. Not too thin, not too thick. Goes on about like a high quality latex paint. So it doesn't run around all over the place like PVA glue can. Clamping a half lap joint is a pretty simple affair too. You need some pressure to pull the two faces together. I'm going to have spring clamps for now, F style clamps after a fashion. And then you need a little bit of pressure to pull the joints tight into each other. Layout for the long sections begins by finding the center point of everything, the rails and the middle board, clamping them all together lined up as close as you can get, squaring it, and then making knife nicks to mark the two outside edges of the half lap joint. Now unfortunately the two long rails are too long to use my stop block or really any kind of stop block, so the two ends of the half lap joint get cut by eyeballing the blade with the knife mark. 
I had to check it a couple of times to make sure I was all the way over to the knife line because they're pretty exact. Then you can hog away the rest of the joint. The front forms the other half of the miter with the sides, so I'm repurposing my spacer block trick to make sure that the ends overhang exactly the thickness of the side material so the miters will come together right. I'm carefully cutting exactly on that knife line because this dictates the overall width of the front of the cage. Then it's another Paul Sellers technique to mark the other side of the half lap joint using the material to gauge thickness, the square to make sure the line is straight, and a knife to make sure it's accurate. Once you get used to lining up these knife lines with the saw blade, you'll be amazed at how accurately and repeatedly you can make cuts even without a stop lock. The glue up is an exact clone of the process for the sides. I'm sticking with the epoxy since it's out and more clamps. Okay guys, I am out of clamps, I am out of space, and in the 50 some odd degrees that my shop is currently, it's gonna take the epoxy a good solid 24 hours to fully cure. So I'm gonna call this part one. In part two, we'll put these frames together with a top and a back, talk about glass versus Lexan and why there's gonna be both in this project, and deal with finishing. We need something durable, maybe even in a human environment, but still safe for the animal. Questions or comments, leave them down below. Think about hitting that sub button while you're down there. There's more to come, but in the meantime, you stay safe, YouTube.